Big news just rolled out from the Draft of Digital headquarters, getting additional library distribution. What does this mean for you as a self-published author? And what does this mean for Draft of Digital getting this acquisition? And I'm just giddy with excitement. And I think everybody saw this in past week's uh, broadcast. Well, furthermore, I'm super, super giddy to welcome here to the podcast and the channel, Mark Coker, the Chief Strategy Officer over at Draft of Digital, and also Micah May, the Director of Ebook Services at the Digital Public Library of America. Guys, thank you so much for taking some time out your day. How you feeling? Hey, Dale. Great to be with you today. Micah, how you doing, man? Good. Thanks, Dale. You I'm know, excited. I'm not going to let you just hang out back in the background. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm well, let's go ahead and jump right into things here. Folks, if you happen to be watching this live right now, we're going to be doing a question and answer after they go ahead and indulge me with a few questions of my own here, because uh, I am really, really curious on how this is going to play out for a lot of the authors leveraging Drafted Digital for publishing their eBooks. So let's just go ahead and start it out with uh, talking with Mark here. Could you give us just an overhead view of what is the DPLA and what is the Palace Marketplace and what does this mean for authors right now? You want to start with me or with Mike? Yeah, Mark, I'm going to get you on okay. this one first. All right, great. So um, Palace Marketplace is operated by the Palace Project, which is part of uh, the Digital Public Library of America. So it's kind of a, from my perspective, it's a next generation library checkout platform uh, operating here in the U.S. only. Um, and it allows librarians to come in and browse for content, acquire content, uh, receive uh, recommendations from fellow librarians who are curating the content and uh, assembling recommended buy lists. Um, and then for patrons, it's an opportunity to um, access, uh, take advantage of the Palace app, which is also produced by the Palace Project. The Palace app sits above all the other uh, library apps and kind of aggregates access to a library's disparate collections that they've acquired from all these different suppliers. So from a single app, patrons can access the library's entire catalog. That's really exciting. So we're, we're really excited at draft to digital to have our authors and our books in this system. Okay, so I did give it to you for a good reason because I wanted to come over and talk with Micah a little bit more about the Digital Public Library and how did uh, the Palace Marketplace come about and of course this relationship with Draft the Digital. Yeah, good question. So you know the Palace Marketplace is part of, as Mark said, the broader Palace Project, which is a nonprofit-driven platform for library e-content service, eBooks and audiobooks. Um, it grew out of an open source project based in your public library called Library Simplified, which was funded by some grants from the Institute of Museum and Library Services in 2012 and 2015. You know, basically libraries recognized, library leaders recognized that they needed a platform they could really control in order to have their values reflected in their service to patrons. Uh, and that included things like protecting patron privacy, the ability to really curate the collections and suggest books that uh, librarians chose to patrons, but also to bring books from different sources together in one interface, as opposed to having to forcing patrons to go to different apps to get to different book collections. So, you know, that's really the goal of Palace is to support libraries in maximizing access for Americans. Um, in terms of DPLA, Digital Public Library of America, uh, it was founded about 10 years ago on that mission of maximizing access, sort of recognizing that we needed to support libraries in making the transition to digital services. So dp.la is the URL, um, and there you can find over 47 million uh, free openly licensed resources, what we call cultural heritage resources. So they're images, uh, you know, scanned text, but mostly not really books. They're things from museums, archives, uh, you know, local historical societies that are aggregated and that search engine makes it easier to find them and helps them be discovered on the web. Um, but from the beginning of DPLA 10 years ago, the goal was to eventually to provide services that would also help libraries provide more robust ebook access. And sort of the missing piece that no other nonprofit was really taking on was a marketplace that would be driven by nonprofits and bring the best possible terms to libraries. So starting in 2017, DPLA launched that. 
this is really cool. And I, I just before we had got connected, Micah, you and I were talking a little bit about your past here. Uh, what brought you into the role working with DPLA? Uh, share just a little bit with that, because uh, I thought your your story was very interesting. OK, well, I, at Dale's urging, I'll share the long version. Uh, if, so I went to law school originally. I wanted to be an environmental lawyer. I thought it was going to be like Aaron Barakovich, but not as pretty. Uh, <laughs> and then um, I so I, you know, I got my law degree and I worked a little bit in the Department of Justice and in the Environmental Enforcement Division and had some pretty unsatisfying experiences. Just the cases took a very long time working on a case for a major polluter that was dumping stuff and the, you know, the plug got pulled on the case for no real reason, like a one paragraph memo from then the Bush administration. Um, and so kind of lost my faith in law as a tool for social and environmental justice. I bailed out and went into big consulting firm, McKinsey and Company. I worked there for four years and then from there became director of strategy at the New York Public Library in 2009. Um, and New York Public Library, like most libraries, you know, we were dealing with a lot of different strategic issues, including how to merchandise collections and branches and things about physical service. But a lot of the biggest challenges were about digital strategy. Uh, and in particular, ebook service, which is, you know, was at the time the fastest growing area of library service uh, and still rapidly growing and you know, got much more important again during the pandemic. So while at NYPL, I wrote a couple of big grants to the Institute of Museum and Library Services, which is the federal organization that gives money to libraries. Um, and that's really where these projects started was with this open source platform. Um, the grant originally was called Library Simplified, and the reason for that name was that it was extremely complicated to get to an ebook from a library. And so we wanted to take that complexity out and make it easier for patrons to access content and also allow libraries to bring lots of different kinds of content together. So it started there, and then in 2017, I transitioned to DPLA to take on this part of the service, which is this library-driven marketplace. So let me transition back over here to Mark, and I think it's important. I don't want to seem like I should assume our viewers know exactly who Mark Coker is, but with a background like that, I think it's important that we go ahead and talk a little bit about Mark, his background before Draft the Digital as the founder of Smashwords. And of course, Smashwords is involved in this whole project with DPLA as well as the Palace Marketplace. So Mark, share just a little bit about uh, your background with Smashwords and how you got into doing that, as well as what this new relationship means for the Smashwords and the Draft the Digital platform. Well, uh, Smashwords, I founded Smashwords about 15 years ago, 16 years ago, after my wife and I had an experience writing our own book and trying to get it published by New York publishers. Publishers said, no, we don't want to publish that book. Previous books that targeted soap opera viewers, which was our target audience, did not sell well, so we're not going to publish you. And I thought, well, this is a travesty. Uh, I imagine millions of writers around the world, just like us, who would never be published simply because a publisher didn't want to take a chance on our work. Uh, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if someone somewhere could make it possible for any writer anywhere in the world to publish at no cost and let readers decide what's worth reading? And so that was the genesis of Smashwords about 15 years ago. Um, and then Smashwords became, you know, a major distributor of self-published ebooks. We were the first to open up OverDrive and several different library platforms. We've always been about opening up access uh, so that uh, writers have a chance to be put in front of their readers so readers can choose if those writers are worth reading or not. So that's what we've been doing for the last 15 years. Last year, um, we were acquired by draft to digital um, our former competitor. Now we are one. Uh, both of us share a common commitment to maximizing the distribution and availability of our author's titles. Uh, both of us share a, a, an extreme commitment to public libraries around the world. We want to support public libraries. We view public libraries as engines of discovery for authors. We think that authors who sell in public libraries are also going to sell more in retail because many of those patrons are going to discover their new favorite authors first at public library. 
Nice. I love it. And I always love hearing your story of Smashwords. And it's just amazing. I've been a huge fan of Smashwords for a number of years, even prior to me even knowing about Draft the Digital. So I'm always geeked up to talk to you, Mark. Uh, Mike, I want to sh shift back over here to you because you guys uh, over at DPLA and the Palace Marketplace have already acquired a number of trad pub books, I think in the millions. You're looking to take on almost half a million new titles. Am I right in saying that from Draft the Digital? How are you able to handle that volume? And also, what What's one of the ways that I, as an author, can take advantage of getting this new distribution? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, the the platform, yeah, is very robust. So we have 1.2 million traditionally published titles. Uh, I can get the exact number, but as of today, it's already over a quarter million of these self-published titles, and it's going to be expanding rapidly through the year. I think we might hit a million of those. Um, you know, our goal, I think like Mark, you know, our passion is access. And we believe that self-published authors and libraries have a lot in common. Um, I, we think publishers and libraries actually have a lot in common. I mean, the one way I think about it is that in some ways we're all on team book, right? I'd rather have my son reading than, you know, playing on his gaming system um, or at least a mix of the two. Uh, and I think that's, you know, something that we all share, uh, you know, that people can learn a lot more and more edifying hobby if they're reading books or consuming audiobooks, And uh, so I think in many ways, we're all on the same team. Uh, and I think self-published authors in particular and libraries, because libraries fundamentally are all about diversity in every sense of that word. Um, they want to have a really wide range of content. You know, libraries are not actually thrilled to just spend all their money on bestsellers. Sometimes they feel a little forced to do that by patron demand. So I very strongly agree with Mark. You know, libraries can be a really powerful engine of discovery for authors and series that patrons might not have otherwise found. You know, we've seen over and over again, the patrons really trust librarian recommendations. Um, and, you know, one interesting little fact on that in some user analysis we did within these library discovery apps, observing patrons, we found that fewer than one in three uh, ever hit the search box. So, you know, two out of three never search their whole session. They're just browsing, looking for something they can borrow. So what you put in front of them is extremely important. Um, in a lot of the commercial apps, that's the most popular books, meaning the New York Times bestsellers are at the top. And if you're browsing through those digital shelves, you might see a few dozen, maybe at most 100 books, where many libraries have tens of thousands of books in their collection that never really get seen. So we have changed that algorithm and the books that people find at the top of the Palace apps are available books, and in many cases, books curated by librarians. And I think using that curation, we can really help patrons discover a wider range of more diverse content, including uh, independently published books. So um, we have a group of librarians called the Curation Corps. Uh, they're all full-time librarians, a couple are retired, but they, you know, uh, experienced librarians, and they work part-time with us to help with various curation tasks. And one of those that's ramping up now is to go through the self-published books and try to bubble up some of the best books that people are going to be really excited about. Um, we know we're going to miss things. We're not going to find all of the good books because there's going to be hundreds of thousands in there. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, but we want to find some of them so the libraries can feel really confident that other librarians have recommended the titles to them and they get a good experience out of the gate and then hopefully go further uh, in acquiring those self-published titles. So in terms of back to your question about how authors can take advantage of this, uh, I mean, for starters, if you're a drafted digital or Smashwords author, you know, opt in uh, or, you know, stay in this library distribution. Um, and then you can encourage your local library to adopt Palace. It's growing really rapidly. It's live in over 400 libraries across the country. We expect to be live in over a thousand by the end of the year um, and, you know, really building momentum. So mention Palace to your local library can be helpful. Um, and then, you know, over the course of the coming year, we hope to also offer some uh, alternate licensing models. Uh, right now, the books from uh, the Smashwords Drafted Digital Platform are available on the perpetual one at a time, which kind of mimics print. We think that's a good place to start, but we also hope to offer, you know, some other options for libraries that helps them have more flexibility in how they acquire these books. I've got a question, I think. Both of you guys could answer this, but let me start with Mark here. Um, getting the library distribution, you've been working with them for a number of years through things like Overdrive, Biblioteca, and such. Um, getting that distribution doesn't always mean you're going to end up on a digital bookshelf. Am I right in saying that? Correct. 
Okay. Yeah, the, getting the distribution is the first step. The second step is you need a librarian to go in there and acquire your book so it's available to their patrons. Okay, so what's the best way for us to do that? Well, other than distributing to the, the libraries, right. um, the next best thing is to recognize that, you know, authors wield armies of passionate readers. And authors are out there all the time marketing their books, encouraging their readers to go to retailers to buy their books. Um, authors should also strongly encourage their readers to go to their public library to get their books. Uh, it's a great way to support the public libraries. It's a great way to drive demand within public libraries to acquire your books. Libraries acquire a lot of books. So that that's one of the most important things I think uh, authors can do um, is to just recommend to all of their readers that they go off and support their public library and read uh, their books at, at these uh, different libraries. Uh, the next thing they can do, I think, is get closer to their local public library. It's not just about selling that single copy of your ebook to your local public library, and your local public library will probably want to acquire that book because you're a local author. But it's really more about um, supporting your local public library. Uh, your, your, your local public library is already doing a great job of promoting a culture of reading and you can partner now with your library to promote a culture of authorship in the local community. So in this way, you're serving the library's patrons and the library's community while also serving yourself and giving back and, and becoming a, a mentor in your community to encourage, um, you know, authors and readers to come together, you know, under the roof of the library and celebrate books. Nice. Okay, I'm going to go over to you, Micah. You are an experienced librarian. What's the best way for me to get my book onto your digital bookshelf if you're a librarian? Does it mean I got to go over and beat you over the head and become best friends with you and wash your car? <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, so I guess just one thing, I'm not technically a librarian. Okay. I'm, I've been in library, I've been working libraries for over a decade, uh, but I don't have a master's in library science. So I just- Gotcha. Okay, so I misunderstood. For all the, li for all the real librarians out there. <laughs> They're I, like, uh, kill the man, he's not a real librarian. <laughs> uh, but I have a lot of respect for librarians. I work with a lot of them. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a good question. I don't think you need to do that. Um, I think that, you know, um, we're going to be working on systems through the course of the year to hopefully bubble up, like I said, you know, eventually thousands of books okay. that we will recommend to our libraries and that we really think they will hurry to acquire. I think Mark's point of engaging directly with your local library okay. uh, to potentially, I mean, a lot of libraries host things like author talks um, and are extremely supportive of local authors, self-published or otherwise. Uh, and I think building that connection in person could be, you know, really valuable. Um, you know, I think of my mother, who's a huge reader, recommends books to my family and tons of friends, kind of a book maven, and never buys a book until she's read it through the library. So she, she'll read it, and if she likes it, she'll buy it and kind of lend it. You know, she's her own little library. Um, and I think there's a lot of folks like that out there uh, that discover titles first and foremost through their local library. So I think I agree with Mark, you're building a connection with your local library. Um, you know, you can join and participate in Palace and advocate for the Palace project. Um, just a quick, you know, practical plug for that. You can get, if you search the Palace project in uh, the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store, you can find the app. Um, you can see if your library is in it by going to add a library. And if not, you can add uh, the Palace Bookshelf, which is one of the libraries there. And you'll be able to find a huge collection of openly licensed titles that you can read. Some of them are quite engaging. Um, and, you know, if you can share that with your library, that might help give them a nudge. Um, so I think there's, again, you know, we're all kind of on team reading, and I think there's a natural alliance between authors and libraries. Um, and uh, so, you know, gently supporting them and encouraging them to acquire your title is a good way to go. This has been fantastic, guys. We've been blazing through a lot of questions. We're getting down to our last few minutes here on this broadcast, but I want to get over to the live Q&A if you guys are eager to answer a few questions. Yep. Yeah. All right. So uh, first one, I'm just going to look here in, in the order I'm seeing them in here. Uh, let's see here. Um, bear with me. I think I seen one. I'm a self-published author. How do I take advantage of DPLA? 
Uh, I think we can get probably just a brief summary because we just mentioned this one earlier. So, Mark, wh how would you answer that one? Well, if you've got your books at draft to digital or Smashwords, just make sure that you're opted in for uh, Palace Marketplace distribution and also be sure to distribute to all the other library platforms that we distribute to because the Palace app supports uh, access to books, even if they're acquired by OverDrive. Nice. Okay, so uh, 120 PAJ says, I just joined, can international persons get this opportunity? Micah. Yeah, um, I know that draft to digital and Smashwords have library distribution internationally. Right now, the Palace Project uh, library sales are only in the US and Canada. Okay. So um, you can certainly download the Palace Project app. Um, you can access the free collection anywhere in the world. But in terms of library sales, those are only for U.S. and Canada. But okay. if the question is, as an international author, can I participate? Can I distribute into the system? The answer is definitely yes. We want your books. Love it. Uh, Easy Graphics says, uh, loving Palace Marketplace distribution. Thank you. That's awesome sauce. I signed up immediately. So thank you so much, Easy Graphics. Appreciate it. Uh, let's, oh, here's a great one from Bonnie being Bonnie. She says, do you see AI becoming more involved in the audiobook to library book industry in the sense of directing content or even producing content? Let's uh, discuss uh, this as it relates to the Palace Marketplace app. Mark, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, the answer is yes. Most, most definitely yes. Um, we have had some discussions and, uh, the, you know, the, the Palace Project and the Palace Marketplace uh, does want uh, AI-generated audiobooks. Uh, draft to Digital uh, has a relationship with Apple that a lot of people have heard about, um, where we're one of their partners uh, assisting in that regard. Uh, many D2D authors are now uh, producing uh, AI audiobooks with Apple. They call it digitally narrated books. And one of the neat things about that agreement is that Apple wants us to distribute these books to public libraries. So um, I expect that's going to happen. It may not happen this year, but probably uh, sometime next year. It's something we definitely want to make happen. Okay, great. Uh, here's another question. This is a very loaded one. How about erotica on both thoughts? So I'm wondering, they're probably asking, is there going to be distribution for erotica? Because I know Smashwords has been great about distributing the erotica and you guys also have the uh, engine for that as well, right? Yeah, so uh, we're currently not distributing erotica to any public library systems. Okay, very good, um, clear cut that, answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, we're not opposed to it, but it's just, it's generally not a category that public libraries are, comfortable uh, taking on. Uh, but, you know, as that changes, uh, we'll be there to supply it. We've got the Erotica certification system at D2D, and we can uh, provide um, specific uh, subcategories of Erotica that are more accept uh, acceptable than other, like others. So if a library wants just mainstream Erotica but doesn't want the taboo, we can do that. But for this relationship, we're starting off no Erotica. Gotcha. It just it, it's way easier this way, I'm sure, because then it starts yeah. to get a little bit iffy because you have to figure out what levels of spiciness are involved in the erotica. Are we dealing with the Fifty Shades of Grey or are we dealing with something a little bit more super, super spicy? <laughs> yeah. And if you think about it, Fifty Shades of Grey uh, really moved the needle uh, toward what is, you know, what's considered mainstream. Yeah, they, they so, definitely you know, erotic romance is now considered mainstream. I will say our first set of selections that'll be live this week is going to be romance titles. So, you know, and I, you know, a little bit connected to what I was saying earlier, you know, librarians by and large are totally against censorship. They want everything to be available. Uh, but they also, sometimes their collections come under a lot of scrutiny. And so, well, maybe being a little conservative, our starting point is going to be to try to give things no one's going to object to and libraries are going to be really excited about. Uh, and I think our goal is that eventually libraries have good experiences with these self-published books and then expand their selections more broadly, you know, potentially into that space. But we didn't want to play into any sort of stereotypes about self-publishing. We want to start with something really safe that felt like everyone was going to see it as a win-win. 
yeah, expand as you go along. That makes complete sense. I've got a question here, and I'm not sure. <clears throat> Maybe we'll have to have more context. Uh, the Epic Spire asked, is the paid collaborator the only what to get contributors credited through the auto automated system? Sorry, I, I just completely butchered up that entire uh, sentence. Again, is the paid collaborator the only what to get contributors credited through the automated system? Not sure. Yes, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't understand. I question. yeah, I'm completely lost on that one as well. Micah looks like he you you got something figured out on this one. <laughs> I mean, I'm just guessing. Like, oh 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 oh. oh. It's a I'm probably asking thing. about the the curation core. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and that's not the only way to get in. No, so, no. All the books are going to be available. I mean, we're you know everything. Okay. We're not filtering anything out. We are just generating uh, recommended selections that we think our libraries will acquire more quickly because they've been specifically held up by a librarian. And our hope is that once they buy those packages, they will be excited about what's there and do some exploration of their own and go further into the collection. Hopefully that answers your question. Yes, that would be awesome. All right, so uh, I've got one more question to wrap up today here. This is a great one, and I'm sure it probably speaks to where you guys are currently um, and where you're potentially going. I could see how you're going to answer this one. Micah, I'm going to give this one to you as well. Mark, feel free to answer. Why is it so heavily in Connecticut and California right now? Yeah, I mean, the short answer is just that Connecticut and California state libraries were the early adopters at the state level of Palace. So Connecticut actually contributed some development resources to enhance the platform. Uh, the California State Librarian, Greg Lucas, drove a statewide effort to sponsor getting their libraries on. So there are a number of other states that have very robust adoptions, uh, Maryland, Montana, uh, about a dozen states. Um, in many cases, though, Palace adoption is being led by a state library who is kind of facilitating other public libraries within their state coming online. And Connecticut and California were two of the leaders there. So um, Palace is eager to serve libraries all across the country and does. Um, but those are places where local leaders saw the value proposition and the benefits for access and rolled out really robust statewide programs. So more of those libraries are, are in. That said, as I mentioned, you know, there's over 400 libraries across the country that are participating in Palace, uh, and we see that expanding very rapidly. We expect to be serving over a thousand libraries by the end of the year. Awesome. Thank you so much, both of you, for taking some time out your day. Folks, if we didn't get your question, please go ahead and drop it inside the comments. I know the team at Drafted Digital typically looks over the comments as well. Uh, Micah, I appreciate you coming on. First time to the channel here. And Mark, one more away from the gold fur coat, baby. <laughs> All right, let's make it happen, Dale. All right, folks. Uh, thank you yeah. so much for tuning in, everybody. And till later, if you got any questions, drop them inside the comments. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in. Special shout out to my channel members for both the podcast channel and the main channel. Without your support, some projects we do at self-publishing with Dale would be much harder to fund. If you want to contribute to the cause, visit dalelinks.com slash memberships for details and get your on-screen shout out at the end of each broadcast. Till later, this has been Self-Publishing with Dale. And I'll see you soon.